Hey, remember how I said last week that I'm still doing sorting algorithms videos? Yeah, I'm still doing sorting algorithms videos. Last week, I extended the sorting algorithms redux series. This week, I'm actually going to extend the sorting algorithms plus plus series instead. To give credit where credit is due, I want to say thanks to my professor, Dr. Liang Hong Wai, for actually, well, teaching us counting sort in class. I'm not actually ripping off his content, but he did help me, you know, reinforce the idea. And now I'm generally confident enough of this particular algorithm to share it with you. In the Sorting Algorithms++ plus plus series, we actually looked at radix sorts, which, you know, would have been easier to understand if I actually taught you counting sort first. So yeah, in retrospect, I should have done that, but well, I'm here to repair that mistake. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching the tuition edition of Sorting Algorithms. Hello and welcome to Sorting Algorithms, the tuition edition. Today, we're going to take a look at counting sort. Now, counting sort is one of those interesting sorting algorithms because it is a non-comparison sorting algorithm. As we know, if we actually write a sorting algorithm that must perform comparisons, then you cannot do better than O n log n time. However, if you don't compare, then this restriction doesn't apply. And that is the magic behind counting sort. Incidentally, counting sort is actually an extremely intuitive method of sorting, which is why I'm going to just jump straight in into the demonstration and well, we can talk more about how it works when we're done with that. So here's our input array. By taking one glance at it, we realize that the only numbers in there are 1, 2, 3, and 4. Then we set up a new array with size 4, and all elements initialized to 0. This array will help us count the number of occurrences of 1, 2, 3, and 4 respectively. Then we're going to make one pass through the original array from left to right. Every time we encounter a particular number, we go to the new array and increment the number by 1. Do you see what's happening here? Essentially, we are counting how many occurrences of each number is there. By making one entire pass through the array, well, we've counted every single number there is. In fact, by just using the array of counts, we can basically reconstruct the sorted version of the original array. Now, there's actually a lot more to this, but what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to mess around with the format of this show just to actually bring something to your attention. Notice what happened in the demonstration you just saw. We only made one pass through the list, and that's enough for us to generate a fully sorted list. Yes, this is a sorting algorithm that completes in O n time. Of course, that's O n with a couple of huge asterisks because of course, there are lots of limitations that will catch you when you're actually trying to do this. But like I said, we'll come to that in time. I just wanted to emphasize the fact that, hey, that's an O and sorting algorithm, not something you see every day, and hopefully that will keep your interest up. Now, the algorithm we just looked at basically reconstructed the list using the count, and that tends to not be something that you can do practically. You see, in practical conditions, we may have little data structures that look like this. Now, I don't really know how much apples, oranges, and bananas cost, so, well, just take this as an example. At any rate, we have basically two values now in a special data structure, that is the name of a product as well as its price. And essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to sort it by price. So of course, if we did what we did just now, well, we'll get all the prices sorted properly, but we won't know what exactly are the products associated with each price. And that is why reconstructing the list by just using the value that was used for the sorting is not going to work. We're going to have to repopulate a new array by using the old one. So what we're going to do is we're going to try the same set of steps again, and well, we're going to do something else so that we can actually keep the rest of the information. So all right, now we have our input array once again, except now every item is also associated with the name of a random fruit. We begin by counting the elements, and this is exactly the same as what we've seen before. However, instead of directly making use of the counts list, what we're going to do is we're going to do some further processing to it as well. So what we've created here is a cumulative sum array. Now, here's how this works. Essentially, you take the count array, and you try to copy all the values down to the cumulative sum array. 
However, you don't just copy the values directly, instead, you actually sum up the elements as you go along. So what we have here is 1, 2, 2 from the count array. I'm going to start off by copying 1 down to the cumulative array. Now, the next value we have in a count array is 2. We take 2 and we add it to 1. The result 3 is saved in the second position of the sum table. Similarly, we have 2 again in a count table, and what we're going to do is we're going to perform the exact same summation. 2 plus 3 gives us 5, and this value goes into the last element of the sum array. So instead of having an array of just the count of each value, now we have an array of partial sums. These values will actually tell us where to put the new items. So alright, our next step is to create a new array, the same size as the old one, and we're going to use this information in the partial sums array to help us repopulate this new array. So this is the magical step. We start off at the rightmost item of the original array. We check its price, and then visit the element in the sums array with the corresponding price. Currently, the box says 3. This means that a grape item should be placed in position 3 of the new array. Yes, the number actually refers to the index. So we go ahead and do that, and when we're done, we decrement the item in the sum array. We move on, now we're looking at the orange item. It costs 80 cents, and the corresponding item in the sum array tells us to place it in position 1. We then decrement the value in the sum array and move on. Bananas for $1.50. We put it into position 5, then decrement the value in the sum array. I'm sure you get how this is going now. The strawberries go into position 4, and the apple goes into position 2. Once you're done, you've got your sorted list. That's it. That is essentially the entire process used by this algorithm. Now, at first glance, this is great. We're only running through an array of n items basically twice. So that would be an O-N algorithm. Except, well, unfortunately, there is a small catch that could possibly make the runtime of this algorithm slightly less pretty. You see, there is a little problem in our trace, and that is when we actually started this entire trace, we just looked at the input array and decided that, okay, the only values there are 1, 2, 3, and 4. That's all well and good, but computers generally cannot just look at an array and decide that. What this means is computers do need to execute some logic to actually find out, first, what values are actually available within the array. Only when it has this sort of understanding of the data can it then actually set up all the buckets that you want to use for counting and, well, manipulate those to give you the final answer. What this means is you may actually have to first perform one pass through the input array and that incurs an additional ON time to just basically understand your input better. Maybe you're just looking for things like maximum and minimum values. Maybe you might even go further to actually sort of store these values and use them later to generate your buckets. Moving on, setting up the buckets also takes time. In fact, if I have k buckets, then I'll need ok time to actually, well, initialize my entire array and set all the values to zero. Then later on, when I actually want to move from having my array to a cumulative array, that is another OK time. Ultimately, what we are doing could take as much as 3n plus 2k time. The first n being to actually understand our data. Then we have k to create all our buckets. We have another n to run through them and count everything. We have another k to create our array of partial sums. And then we have our final n to actually populate our final result array. What this means is, under the big O notation, the time complexity of this algorithm is actually O n plus k. And maybe you're thinking, hey, surely we could eliminate something here, because normally when we express things in big O notation, we don't have a plus sign there. We eliminate the value that is smaller. And that is true, except in this case, we cannot really tell. This all depends on how you set up your buckets. Now, let's say I have an array that looks like this, I analyze it, but I only look for the minimum and maximum value. I see that the minimum value is 1 and the maximum value is 10. So what I do is I set up 10 buckets from 1 to 10. This creates a situation where k is actually larger than n. Without looking at any data, speaking just generally for counting sorts, we cannot tell whether n or k is larger. 
and therefore we keep both in the final time complexity. Alright, we're nearly done here, but let us just cover a couple more things. First, this sorting algorithm is stable. Recall the definition of stability for things that are equal in terms of the actual sorting. Their original permutation isn't actually changed up. What this means is for everything that costs a dollar, their relative order doesn't change in the final result and array. So yeah, that's stability and counting sort is stable. However, counting sort is not in place. I mean, as you can see, we generated quite a few additional arrays and well, that means it's not in place. And there you go, that's counting sort in a nutshell. Definitely not your usual sorting algorithm because of course, this is a non-comparison sorting algorithm. Notice of course that we've never actually taken two elements in the array and compared them against each other. We just learn about the data and use grouping to solve this problem. And there you have it, that basically wraps it up for this episode of Sorting Algorithms Tuition Edition. Thank you very much for watching, I hope you learned something today. But until next time, you're watching 0612 TV. Hello, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget I appreciate every like, favorite and comment you give me. If you'd like to see more from me in the future, don't forget to subscribe. For more updates outside of YouTube, do follow my official Twitter account at 0612TV. And if you'd like to see more of my work, you can also check out my About Me page. Once again, thank you very much for watching and until next time, you're watching 0612TV.